Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. I want to tell you a long story. <laughs> and depending on how I tell you, I could have started a billion years ago or a hundred years ago. So I took the shortcut. I'll start a hundred years ago with Einstein's theory of gravity. I don't know what that is. In 1915, uh, Einstein published his theory of general relativity that is actually a theory of gravity. It's a theory of gravity that replaces Newton's theory of gravity because it says that masses do not attract each other because of this instantaneous force, but they actually live in a space-time. And space-time sounds very mysterious, but you have to imagine it as a three-dimensional grid the grid that measures the distances with clocks in all the corners to measure time. And then what masses do, according to Einstein, is deform that space-time. And the Earth then goes around the Sun, not because there is this force of gravity, but because it sees the distortion of space-time and it follows the shortest path, which is a curved path in space-time. So that was Einstein's theory. And just a year afterwards, he also wrote about a prediction of his theory that when masses move, this distortion of space-time is dynamic and travels and carries energy, and those are gravitational waves. But he finished that paper putting some numbers indicating that that was probably never going to be measured because the effect is tiny. The effect of these uh, gravitational waves changing distances, the distances between us, is so tiny that it was considered impossible to be measured. For example, the gravitational waves that you probably know, we have discovered <laughs> very recently, uh, these, the largest ones that we have seen coming from black holes merging a billion years ago, that's the early origin of the story, produced a distortion in the distances of 10 to the minus 21. That's like comparing the size of an atom to the distance between the Earth and the Sun. In the 70s, so now it's quite a bit farther in the history, uh, people thought that it could perhaps be measured if we used precision interferometry. Interferometry means having light, a wave split in two with a beam splitter, getting reflected in mirrors some distance away, and when the waves come back and get out of the detector, if these two distances are the same, the waves cancel each other and there is no light. But if these distances change because, for example, there's a gravitational wave going through, then on this photo cell you will see more light, less light, more light, less light. Now, to measure a part in 10 to the 21 with these interferometers was not trivial. It took decades of effort. But more importantly, it took investment, long-term planning and long-term investment. And this was the National Science Foundation, which in the 80s, late 80s, considered proposals that seemed to be very controversial at the time to use interferometers to measure these gravitational waves. These interferometers would have to be very long because the effect is proportional to the distance. There would have to be two, so you could, you could confirm the observation of gravitational waves with two independent detections. And that is how the LIGO project was born. It was Ray Weiss at NMIT and Kip Thorne in Caltech who put these institutions together to write the proposals, to convince the NSF, to convince the scientific community to invest in this. But the most incredible thing <laughs> is that the investment was known to be at the time that it was going to take a long time because this 10 to the minus 20, 21 sensitivity that was projected at the time was the amplitude of the noise that was going to be measured. And you needed to make that noise smaller. So from the beginning, it was thought that this was going to be a two-step process, that there were going to be initial LIGO detectors and advanced LIGO detectors. 
And if we were lucky, initial LIGO detectors were going to measure gravitational waves, but if not, advanced LIGO detectors would. This was approved in 89, in the 90s. That was when I immigrated from Argentina to the US. I had studied general relativity, the theory. I had fell in love with the theory of relativity. That's how I met my husband, too. So I love the theory for, <laughs> even more for that. Uh, we came to the States in the 90s, and I learned about this project, and I loved it. I wanted to do this. And that's what I've been doing ever since. This was not happening only in the US. This was happening all over the world. There were the LIGO detectors in the US. In Europe, there were two projects, a British-German project called GEO, a French-Italian project called Virgo, and they built detectors. This was a smaller detector and then uh, joined forces with a LIGO uh, project, and we call that the LIGO collaboration, and I'll tell you more about that. Virgo has a different collaboration. It has grown then, but it also works together. We learned to work together, even though these projects started independently and perhaps a bit competing with each other. In the end, we knew that together we were going to be stronger, and that's what, that's what happened. There are two other detectors in construction, one in Japan, one in India. So this is a worldwide effort. Now, these are not simple Michelson detectors. <laughs> they are actually very, very complicated. They are an engineering marvel. And that's why it took not just so, many, so long a time, but so many people. There, this project needed engineers, physicists, physicists that analyze the data, the noisy data that comes out of the detector, physicists that put all of this technology together, and I can spend hours talking about this. This is what I love the most, this is what I do, is make the instruments work and think about how to make them more sensitive. All of this, because it needed so many people, all of this led in the late 90s to form the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. This is a collaboration that grew from about 200 members in 1997 to 1,200 members now. We have members in 18 different countries. Uh, in the first person to lead it was Ray Wise from MIT. Uh, the second uh, person and the first democratically elected spokesperson was Peter Solson, and these are my two mentors. Peter Solson is a professor in Syracuse University. He was the one that showed me this project, the thing that I really wanted to do. And he has been such a patient person because converting me from a theorist to an experimentalist took a while. <laughs> um, and then I went to work, I went to MIT to work with, uh, with Ray Wise. And then I had my own lab, first in Penn State and now in Louisiana State University, very close to one of the LIGO detectors. Uh, since then, there have been several other spokespersons. I was a spokesperson between 2011 and 2017. Now it's David Shoemaker and Laura Cadonati um, from MIT and Georgia Tech. But what I want you to think is that this is not just a map. It's not just a few people. It's 1,200 people. And each of these spots is a group that has between 10, 20 to 100 people each. And these are all young and senior men and women, people from different cultures, and that's what makes this work. Now, you all know, I think, <laughs> that in 2015, uh, on September 14 of 2015, we finally detected <laughs> gravitational waves. We didn't think we were going to detect them, actually. We thought that we, uh, we needed more sensitive detectors, but we had been preparing to begin taking data to see if there was anything there, and it took us by surprise. This is a gravitational wave we see. What you see in here is a signal in the photocell in Hanford, the signal in the photocell in Livingston. These are observatories, photocells, 3,000 kilometers away. And what you see is something that looks, it's noise in here, and it looks like a sine wave that grows in amplitude and frequency, and then disappears, disappears in the noise. That's exactly what we expected from the coalescence of black holes. 
of binary, a binary system of black holes that was getting closer and closer together and merged into a single black hole. And a single black hole does not emit gravitational waves. But the binary system, a system dancing the tango, like I like to say, does emit gravitational waves. And that's what we saw. This paper was published by the joint LIGO and Virgo collaborations. It was also published on February 11, when we had a press conference. And you may, not, you may or may not remember, that day was the first day celebrated as the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. So I thought it was very appropriate that it was a woman scientist from Co France Cordova presiding the press conference when we announced this monumental discovery. Now that was the first gravitational wave. In, in October, we think that we saw something, but it wasn't that loud, so we could not confirm. In December, we saw another one, this one coming from smaller black holes. Now, if it is smaller black holes, it turns out that we can see more of the signal because it coalesces at a higher frequency, it spends more frequency in our band. And what we did is put these signals, translate them into sound. So this is what they sound like. There's a short one and a long, long one. We are going to play the long one first. Notice the time scale. That's just a fraction of a second. That's what we saw on September 2015. We were only going to take data for a few months, and we did, and then we went down to keep improving the sensitivity of our detector, because we have the potential to be three or four times better than we were then. We measured our sensitivity in the distance uh, that makes us sensitive to the, to the merger, not of black holes, because we knew, didn't know about black holes then, <laughs> about binary systems of black holes. We measured this as the distance to mergers of neutron stars. So we, we were down, and then in November 2016, we started taking data again. Virgo was going to join us sometime later. We didn't exactly know when. Um, January 4th, we measured the third coalescence of black holes. In June, we measured another. By then, we were saying, oh, let us alone. <laughs> Publishing and studying all these signals actually took a long, long time. But, and we, we were waiting for Virgo, and we had to go down. However, LIGO detectors had to go down on August 25. So we really wanted to take some data together. They joined us on August 1st. So we were only going to take data for a couple of two or three weeks. That was going to be nice, but we thought it was just going to be a test. It wasn't. On August 14, last year, so this is very recent news, uh, we saw another coalescence of black holes, but this one was very different because it had three detectors. With three detectors, we can triangulate. And we had been sending alerts to astronomers telling them, look there, <laughs> because with two detectors you cannot see much. But here, we could tell them, look there. Nothing was seen. We were not surprised, because these are coalescences of black holes. Black meaning they don't emit light. But on August 17, we saw the light. <laughs> we saw a signal that was coming from much, much smaller objects. So these were probably neutron stars. And we knew they were neutron stars, or we suspected, because not only we were measuring, uh, looking for signals at the time, but there are satellites out there looking for all kinds of signals. And the Fermi satellite, in particular, was always looking for gamma rays. And they saw gamma rays very close in time. So this is that. Look at the time. We saw 100 seconds. That's a gamma ray. Only a couple of seconds later, after light having traveled 130 million light years. Amazing. This proves that they both travel very, very close to the speed of light together. 
But there was a lot more than that. Because we could localize, because Virgo, if this was a three detector detection, we could tell astronomers, look there, and now you might see things because these were neutron stars. And they did. I call this a kilonova rainbow because it was seen not just in gravitational waves and in gamma rays. Those were the first signals. Uh, but then there was an optical confirmation that was quite blue. Then there was ultraviolet. Then there was infrared that got stronger. Then there was radio and X-rays quite a bit later. And we are still learning from this. There are still X-ray and radio signals coming from that spot in the sky. So this was amazing. And again, we published a paper, not on any significant date, except that it was October 2nd, the day before we submitted it. Um, October 2nd, the day before the Nobel Prizes were announced. <laughs> and we also published the same day a paper with astronomers. These papers have a thousand authors. This paper had 3,000 authors. <laughs> and this long list you see in here, it's not a list of authors, it's a list of collaborations. This was really, really teamwork. And this was a value of teamwork. On October 3rd, we learned about the Nobel Prizes. We were very, very happy to see that the work had been recognized, the pioneers of the field. Barry Barish was instrumental in directing the, the LIGO laboratory and creating the LIGO scientific collaboration. And we also saw, were very happy to see that in the Nobel Press release, they credit as affiliations for the three of them the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. This was a nod to teamwork, and that's what we are very, very proud. Now, what's going to happen now? People tell me, what next? <laughs> There's a lot more to do, because we don't want to see black holes once every few months. We want to see many black holes. We want to see more neutron stars. We want to see other signals, bursts, continuous waves, and that is all coming. We are going to be down, improving sensitivity, and taking data for the next few years. CAGRA is going to join us perhaps next year in 2019, if not probably 2020. So this network is really growing. And this is detectors, interferometric detectors on the ground. Gravitational waves come also in other colors, in other wavelengths. For those, you need other telescopes, other instruments, and those are all either functioning or in the works. There's a space interferometer called LISA that has been approved by the European Science Collaboration, European Space Agency, sorry, <laughs> collaboration, uh, with radio astronomy looking at the phase coherence of radio signals coming from neutron stars. I call this a galactic interferometer. And looking at the very early universe, looking for clues of these gravitational waves in the microwave background. So a new era has started in gravitational wave astronomy. I was a small part of this, but this has all been a lot of decades that started, a lot of more decades that will follow of teamwork and very, very exciting news. Thank you. <laughs>